Um, I have the distinct pleasure of introducing Dr. Bernhardt to you today. We were so excited to have her come to Atlanta to talk to us about public health, about her work in quality, safety, and um, health uh, services research, specifically in the rural care population. Um, she has done extensive work, as you're going to hear, in South Africa and across the country. She's a dynamic speaker. She is coming to us from the um, Virginia Commonwealth University and um, has been well-funded, well-published. I think that we are extremely honored to have her here as a complement to our theme in population and public health. And so I'm going to turn it over to her. And at the end, we'll wind up and I'll give you some tidbits about where we're going to go next um, uh, for the rest of the day. So please welcome Dr. Bernhardt. Thank you. Thank you. Let me change the slides. Oops. And she's technologically savvy. <laughs> no, not really. <laughs> but I do know how to change the slides. <laughs> Sorry. Well, um, as you can see, I'm going to be talking about how we can expand nursing science in global rural healthcare quality. And I want to thank Caroline for that nice introduction and tell you what a great honor it is to be here. One of my first presentations when I started out as a nurse scientist was at SNRS in Galveston. And at that, pres at that conference, we presented on rural health care, methods to do uh, research in rural health care. Most of my presenters at that time have since retired, but um, it was a great start for me as a, a budding nurse scientist. So it's a great honor to be invited back and talk about um, my research trajectory and how, from then on, um, I have done different things. So I was asked to talk about my research trajectory, and I use that as an example to show how nursing science can add in expanding the glo global rural healthcare quality. So I am a scientist, so it's all about the data and what it tells us. So here are my stats. Oh, and by the way, there is time for questions afterwards. So if you have any, let me know. So the stats on me. I have been a nurse for more than 30 years. I started in Denmark, and then I moved to the US in 1985. My clinical background is in critical care. And yes, it is me on the picture, but it's not 1854. <laughs> This was a photo shoot uh, for my graduation, and it's my little brother who is the patient. It took quite a few beers to get him to look like that, <laughs> but we succeeded. Um, and I have used the picture freely since, without his permission. <laughs> I've been an educator for more than 25 years. I've taught in three states and at all levels of nursing education except for diploma, but I did teach an uh, associate degree, degree program in Arizona. And I've been an international scholar for 20 years. It cum culminated in um, around 2010 when I became the director of international initiatives at the School of Nursing at University of Virginia where I oversaw sending students to 20 countries and also did work um, myself in some of those countries and also globalized the curriculum at that time and Janie Heath is here and she might remember how I sat in her office and we talked all this through. Finally, and this is what I'm going to talk about today, I've been a scientist for 13 years and let me give you an overview of my talk as a scientist. So, for all of you in the room, you know, when we do anything, we always start with keywords, our mesh terms. And I'm going to talk about mine. Then I'm going to talk about my research trajectory. And then I'm going to talk about some systems interventions that I have done as a parallel set of projects to my research trajectory. They kind of overlap. 
research projects, you know how, especially this day and age, we have to distinguish when we do one or the other, but really the area is pretty gray. And then finally, I will end with new frontiers as I see them, that where, how we can expand nursing science in population and global health and beyond those two. So, all the work I'm presenting is related to at least two of these terms, Ubuntu, rural, global, and quality. And don't worry, I will define each one. So let's start with a term I learned in 2009 on my first trip to South Africa, Ubuntu. We are all connected. But for those of you that are computer literate, it's also a Linux operating system. <laughs> that is not what I'm going to talk about today. <laughs> so what I am going to talk about is the original meaning, which Desmond Tutu in 1999 said, I am what I am because of who we are. He further said, a person with Ubuntu is open and available to others, affirming of others, does not feel threatened that others are able and good, based from a proper self-assurance that comes from knowing that he or she belongs in a greater whole, and is diminished when others are humiliated or diminished when others are tortured or oppressed. He further added in 2008, you cannot exist as a human being in isolation. I will reword his, what he said and say, you do not become a nurse scientist in isolation. You are interconnected with others where you learn and share in order to produce new knowledge. So, here are some of the people that I learned from. Without the connections with all of these people and many more, I could not have done the work I'm presenting today. And I think that is one of the biggest take home message for those of you that are starting out on your scientific career. You have to lean on others, you have to be interconnected. Don't worry, this is not where is Waldo. There will, this slide will come back so you can see who is up there uh, towards the end of my presentation. But I wanted to acknowledge all these people. So, the next key word is rural. And again, what is that defined as? Well, if you're a rural researcher in the US, you have your choice. Because there are more than 15 definitions in, of rural used in federal programs in the United States. So as a scientist, that makes it pretty hard because I can take any data and get anything out of it depending on what definition I use, and they're pretty different. So if we look at the world, the definition offered by the UN is this. The characteristics that distinguish urban from rural areas, the distinction between the urban and the rural population is not yet amenable to a single definition that would be applicable to all countries, or for the most part, even to the countries within a region. What does that really mean? It means all that is not urban. <laughs> so that's not very helpful either. Uh, so what does rural look like? Let me give you a few examples. Looks like this. And these are two of the rural areas where I've done my research. And some of, it, some of them are from Southwest Virginia and some of them are from South Africa. And can you tell which ones are which? Not really, not even the ones on the front row, but the ones with the arrows are from Southwest Virginia. One could also ask, what does rural feel like? So, they are in our midst, but often overlooked. And that is how they feel like if you talk to rural population. So the guys on the island that are waving are the rural population, and they're saying to each other, yes, yes, this is it, Sydney. The guy with the dog, I think he sees us. We often overlook our rural population. 
So let me give you a few facts uh, about rural. There's 46 million people in the U.S., or 14% of the population that live in 72% of our land masses that is considered rural. If we go to the world, it's about 46% of the world population that live in rural areas. So what are the characteristics, characteristics of these communities? And I'll just give you the stats from the U.S., but they could be global as well. They have higher rates of poverty, unemployment, older adults, people with chronic diseases, and on top of that, they have fewer resources. For example, all rural areas have less providers than urban areas. Which brings me to the next key term, which is global. And global really speak to how we can learn from each other, which is why I also have it in my um, title of the presentation. So the way I understand global is, as nurses, we need to be global. What that means is we have to take global evidence and use it locally wherever we are. And this term was coined by the former CEO, Judith Olton, from uh, the International Council of Nurses back in 2004. But back to Ubuntu. Global is also about sharing through our interconnectedness. And how can we best do so? Somebody else that has informed my work is Sir Nigel Crisp. He suggested in 2010 that we turn the world upside down. He um, was uh, the leader or the director of the National Health System in, in the UK and has done a extensive work in uh, global areas. And in 2010 in this article, he said, richer countries import many health workers from poor countries, while at the same time exporting their ideas and ideologies about health. It's an unfair exchange. What would it be like if it were the other way around and poor countries imported health workers from rich ones and exported their ideas and experiences about health? In many of the examples I'm, I'm going to give you from my work, that is exactly it learning from each other and from each other's strength at an equal footing. So my last key term is quality. And it has been around for a long time. One of the first definitions on quality is from Aristotle. And he defined it as quality describes the inherent nature of an object. Quality also includes physical descriptions. And of course, one cannot talk about quality without mentioning the most famous nurse and first healthcare quality researcher, Florence Nightingale. When she went with a group of nurses to the Crimean War in 1854, just like me on the first slide, she <laughs> did something remarkable. She completely reorganized the hospitals, first in uh, the Crimean War and later in both England and India. But what she was really savvy about, and here's where the statisticians claim her too, she was one of the first statisticians because she, knew she used data. She knew that she had to collect data in order to get policy done and changed. So. What you have up here is the diagram, the Rose diagram that she invented. The one that is biggest, I'm not going to say right and left because that always gets confused when you talk to people that are in front of you. So the biggest one um, is before she improved how she, they delivered care. For example, that there were not two soldiers in one bed, but they each had a bed and that everything was cleaned. It was very simple stuff in our minds, but not for that time. And that is, as I said before, and the one closest to her picture is after. And what is in blue is preventable deaths. And what she did is her diagram is to size. So you can see all deaths went down after her 
um, implementations, but even more so, the blue ones went, went down dramatically. All right, finally, the one definition we use the most today is from the National Academy of Medicine, formerly known as the Institute of Medicine. And they say the degree to which health services for individuals and population increase the likelihood of desired health outcomes and are consistent with current professional knowledge. And that definition is from 2001, and that's the one that healthcare quality researchers still use. All right, so those were my key terms. So, now that you know my key terms, let me tell you how they have influenced my work in global rural quality. And here I want to say, especially for those of you starting out, for the rest of you, I'm sure you have similar experiences. I did not start out thinking this is what I was going to do. I didn't think I was going to focus on rural areas of quality per se. But my first study set me on that path. So let me tell you about my first study, which partly took place here, but I'll talk about that. My first study was government chief nursing officers' perceptions of barriers to using research on nurse staffing. At the time, there was global evidence about nurse staffing that it would work to improve outcomes and quality. So what I did was I took the evidence and synthesized it and presented it to government chief nursing officers. Now, government chief nursing officers, uh, each country has one or two that are in ministers of health or something like it. So um, those were the ones that were my uh, target population. And I asked them, here's the evidence. Why do you think you can or cannot use it? I was specifically interested in why they could not use it. What are the barriers? So here are my results. I sent out emails to 131 CNOs from 110 countries because some countries had more than one. The UK, for example, had one for each country. England, Wales, Scotland, Ireland. And in Australia, they had um, also one for each um, area of Australia. This study was supported by the International Council of Nurses and WHO and from the Lillian Carter Center for International Nursing here at Emory. It's now the Lillian Carter Center for Global Health and Social Responsibility. They had a government chief nursing officers institute and network meeting in 2004, where I was allowed as a student to participate and recruit for my study. So my participant sample, the people that ended up in my sample was 38 CNOs. And I write out of 108, not 131, because the 108 were the emails that didn't bounce back. I don't know that the 108 actually reached somebody, but at least they didn't come back to me. And so that gives me a response rate about 35 to 45 percent, depending on um, how you calculate it. I had 19 CNOs from high gross national income countries and 19 from low gross national income countries. And of course, I can't tell you what countries they are because it's an, typically an N of one from each country and that then they wouldn't be anonymous. Some people um, chose not to, to respond, by the way, because even at that time it was a hot political topic and they were in all over the world. They couldn't talk about why they thought nurse staffing should be part of a policy. But the major barrier that they all of these 38 um, said was, all these studies have been done in the US in urban areas. How do I know this apply to my area? So I pondered about this and I set out to look at rural hospitals and healthcare there because that's what they told me. Most of the world does not have big academic medical centers or big hospitals in general. It's smaller hospitals. So to make it more manageable though, I started out in the US. So my first steps, I had to um, 
develop a con conceptual model and examine what rural hospitals look like. So remember I started by looking at staffing and the evidence about staffing. So in my conceptual model, that's the central piece in the middle because staffing is part of the nurse work environment. So staffing adequacy is really staffing, but professional practice and other things, in the, if nurses can do professional practice, is important as well. And we knew that back in 2004 when I did this study. I also looked at external environment, hospital characteristics, nursing unit characteristics, and the combination of the two's um, impact on quality of care. This um, conceptual model is based on contingency theory. So what that says is there has to be a fit between the structure and the context. So for example, um, staffing in the middle on the staffing adequacy is affected by the community or the external environment. How many nurses are there there? You can't talk about staffing in isolation. If there are no nurses around the hospital, you're not going to have any in the hospital. So that is uh, the underlying assumption in this theory. So back to rural hospitals in the US, what do they look like? That was my second piece. And rural hospitals represent more than 40% of non-federal short-term general and specialty hospitals in the US. So it's actually a pretty sizable part of our healthcare system. Um, I updated these numbers just this week. So now we have 1,825 of the nation's 4,840 community hospitals that are in rural areas. And the reason why I updated them is, in case you don't know, since 2010, 82 of the rural hospitals have closed. And according to the National Rural Health Association, 700 more will close within the next 10 years if we don't do something. And this is often the only source of health care for rural populations, the 46 million Americans that live in rural areas. Of these hospitals, two-thirds had 100 beds or less. And about 1,400 are critical access hospitals. And some of my studies take place in critical access hospitals, so let me explain what they are. They are part of a federal program where they receive cost-based reimbursement. It's called the FLEX program. And in order to be a critical access hospital, they applied back when the program started. They had to be located more than 15 to 35 miles from another hospital, and 15 to 35, because it depends on the terrain and road access, not really the distance. 15 miles over the mountains can take you an hour and a half. Um, so that's really what they were looking at as well. They, have, they can have a maximum of 25 acute care and swing beds. Swing bed is a bed that can be an acute care bed one day and a skilled nursing facility bed the next day. The patient doesn't move, but how the bed is paid for um, is really what changes. Um, in return for the, being in the FLEX program, besides having swing beds, they also have to have 24-hour emergency care service available, and that is really key. Because again, as I said, a lot of rural populations receive their health care in these hospitals. And their acute care average length of stay can be no more than 96 hours. So again, if a patient needs to be in the hospital longer than that, they swing the bed to be a skilled nursing facility bed. So where are they located? They are actually all over. People are usually surprised when I show these slides. Oh, I didn't know that we had one in my state. But there are only a few states that don't have them. Connecticut, Delaware, Maryland, New Jersey, and Rhode Island. So all of your states, except for those of you from Maryland, um, do have critical access hospitals. They look very different from state to state and even from hospital to hospital. But the key, as I said, is they are the major um, healthcare provider for an area. So what about quality in rural areas now that I told you um, what at least part of the healthcare um, network looks like? Here the results are mixed. In 2004, 
there were more than 300 quality indicators for hospitals. They were endorsed by the National Quality Forum, or NQF. And an expert panel sat down and looked at them and said, only 20 are applicable for rural hospitals. If we look um, last year, the 700 was last year, we have more than 700 quality indicators that are endorsed by the National Quality Forum. And I don't think the percentage is much higher today um, than what it was in 2004 in terms of what quality indicators are applicable to rural areas. Uh, because rural hospitals do not have the volume or the quality improvement programs or the policy payment requirements that urban hospitals do, so they kind of skews the results and the things we measure. So with the difference in mind, I did a study where I compared quality of care and nurse outcomes in rural and urban nursing units. However, um, what the study I did this from is uh, the largest rural hospitals. If you look, I had 22 rural hospitals with 44 units and 75 urban hospitals with 150 units in this sample, but they had beds from 99 to 450 beds. So this is the one third of rural hospitals that are the largest in terms of how many beds they have. So again, this was a secondary data analysis of the Outcomes Research in Nursing Administration study uh, led by Barbara Mark. And the data was collected in 2003 and 2004 from approximately 2,800 patients and 3,300 nurses. And then they used the Annual Hospital Association survey for characteristics of the hospital. I used my conceptual model and I had variables in all of those categories, about 30. And what we did, we looked first at nurse outcomes. We found no difference in job satisfaction, intent to leave, and turnover rates between rural and urban nursing units. In contrast, we did find differences among the patients. Patients were more satisfied with their care in rural hospitals. And these were all scales. This was not, are you satisfied or not? And this was before we had the surveys that all patients have to take in hospitals today. But these were validated scales. And of the 30 so variables we had in the analysis, it was really only the nurse's commitment to care that was significant along with the location. So we couldn't really explain why patients were more satisfied in rural areas. And this is what science is about. You figure something out and then you have 10 more questions. So how come we found a difference? Is it the definition of quality that's different as I just alluded to two slides ago or so? Or are there different factors that impact quality in rural areas? The next two studies examine those questions. So the first one we did, we looked at how do rural nurses define quality of care? And um, we went to four rural hospitals in Southwest Virginia with 25 to 132 beds. So we had the whole gamut of sizes in terms of rural hospitals on purpose. And we interviewed the chief nursing officers and we did focus group with staff nurses. And then we analyzed the qualitative data using content analysis. And this is what we found. These are the themes. And by the way, they were the same among the CNOs and the staff nurses. So it's all the nurses that this ended up being. Community connectedness help us succeed. That was one thing they said was quality. And they explained that was between staff and patients, staff volunteers in the community, and the community volunteers in the hospital. And everybody knows everybody. So there's really an interconnectedness. The other thing, and they're not in a specific order, they're all equally important. The other thing they said is, patients are what matter most. We always put the patient first. This is your neighbor or friend, so they are at the center. You know them from the grocery store. And then they talked about transfer time, because again, the talk was quality. They said, you know, Quality could really be measured here if we looked at transfer time. 
How fast did we get the patient to another organization for services we cannot provide? This is a quality indicator that would be appropriate. And I will add that some rural hospitals actually do collect this measure now. Finally, quality indicators that everybody is using, including the 20 I talked about earlier, they knew them. And they knew even one adverse event would increase their rate enormously because of their, don their denominator so small. If you have two patients in a unit and one of them fall, your fall rate is 50%. Obviously, they're not reporting that because you can't do that statistically or any other way. But they said, even with one fall, we look at, take it very seriously. So we went on to the next study where we ask, what are the factors that influence quality of care in rural areas? And this time we ask staff nurses because they are really the one practicing quality. So we went to critical access hospitals and we did a web-based Delphi survey where you, in the first survey, ask open-ended questions. They can write whatever they want. You have some key in, um, lead-in questions. And then you do a content analysis and you come up with items. And in survey rounds two and three, they rate them. And then you figure out, okay, which one did they agree on? So that's what we did with, with the critical access hospitals, staff nurses in critical, seven critical access hospitals in two states. What we found agreement on was 150 items. They had a lot to say. So what the nurses identified is, and I'll take them according to the levels here, um, that is um, part of the Institute of Medicine or National Academy of Medicine's framework when we look at quality. Eight of the items were at the patient level. For example, patient characteristics and their needs. 119 were at the microsystem level, which is the nursing unit or the clinic that the nurses worked in. How do we provide nursing care? What do we do? What about nurse manager support, staffing, and teamwork? Those were all part of those 119 items. Most of them we measure when we do this kind of research, but there were a few new ones. 15 items were at the organization. That had to do with the hospital administration, the services they provided, and the physical environment. And then they had eight items at the environment level. And that went back to the ties between the community and the hospital. It's not surprising that the microsystem got 119 items in this uh, study, because that is what staff nurses know the best. That's what they are doing. And that is also where quality is made or lost, as Don Bervik says. He's the founder of the in, uh, IHI, and also the former director of CMS, among other things. Simultaneously with these studies, in hospitals, we also tried to figure out how quality um, looks like in the community. Maybe the communities are not quality, but maybe the communities are different. Could that be why quality in the hospital looked different? So we compared quality of life in rural and urban community dwelling older adults. So here, we went back to secondary data, and we used the National Health and Nutrition Examination Survey, or the NHANES, and the area resource file where you can find um, definitions for rural and urban that are more fine-tuned than most of the 15 that I mentioned previously. It's one of the 15, but it's more fine-tuned. And when you, the National Health and Nutrition Examination Survey, or the NHANES, is a publicly available database that anybody doing any research in the community can go in and just extract data. This, it's out of the CDC, just down the street. And uh, what they have, if you need access to data that is not publicly available in this data set, they have a remote access system. And because rural and urban if you knew, when you extracted all of these variables, if you knew people lived in rural and urban areas, you might actually be able to identify a person in a community. So you cannot do this research uh, having rural and urban comparisons. You can, but you can't do it yourself. That's why we use the remote access system. 
So we would tell them, this is our hypothesis, please run uh, the regression. And then they would give us results. We would look at the results, and then we would send it back, and they would run some more. That is still the system they have in place for most of their surveys. If you want to look at data that where the cell sizes get so small, they are afraid that you can identify them. They do the same thing with some of the race and, and ethnicity um, variables because it's a representative sample of the U.S. population, and it's weighted. So they are afraid that you might be able to recognize people. Anyway, what did we find? We had 911 older adults with data on all 19 variables we were interested in. We created or extracted these variables. The survey has thousands of people, but this is what we came up with with what we were interested in. And what we found was that we looked at quality of life and we looked at these people. The dimensions, um, health-related quality of life, social functioning, and emotional well-being. And we also had other variables in there. As I said, we had 19. We looked at needs, which were included with ADL, depression, memory problems, number of chronic conditions, how healthy were these people. We had to control for that in order to talk about their quality of life. And we found that rural older adults had lower social functioning um, when we had looked at everything else. So the results show there are differences in the community population in rural and urban areas. But what about quality outside of the hospitals? What, when, what happens when we look across the care continuum? Because so far, I've only looked at the community and the hospital. So an opportunity came to, to examine care in hospice. So that's what we did. We compared quality of hospice care for rural and urban residents. And it was one hospice organization in northern Florida with seven satellite offices that um, offered us to do this study. They actually contacted us. And what was unique about this, hospice care is typically given in uh, much smaller facilities. This is one of the largest in the U.S., and it's also one of the only ones that have both urban and rural patients. So in terms of their seven satellite offices, they were both in rural and urban areas. So our sample was 743 patients and their families who had received hospice care. So this was the first study, as far as we know, of this large sample where you actually spoke with people while they were dying. So we had some, we had to be careful, we had some ethical um, considerations here with the hospice, which by the way was very well regarded and had numerous of awards. So what we did, we tagged onto what the hospice was already doing. The hospital would routinely call people within seven days of them being enrolled in hospice, just to ask if they had everything they needed. This call was typically 10 minutes or less and they would either talk to the patient or a family member or caregiver that was there. And it was completely focused on patient and family needs. We used that data, and we were able to ad adapt it a little so that we could talk about quality. And, and among other things, we found overall satisfaction with hospice care was higher in rural areas. So this is an organization where everything should be the same because it's one organization, and still, even in one organization, uh, the people in rural areas were more satisfied in one of the most difficult and vulnerable times of their lives while they were dying. And there were no difference whether we ask patient or family members, whether we ask children or um, a spouse or a significant other. They all said the same thing. So far, it sounds like all our research went according to plan. But that never happens. So when life gives you lemons, you make lemonade. So I want to tell you about a study where we had to make a lot of lemonade. And this one goes back to the hospitals. So I'm using the same conceptual model, but this time we wanted to do primary data collection. 
And um, we started out saying we're going to do this in North Carolina and Virginia. They have 68 hospitals. We'll be fine. Great sample size. However, only 20 hospitals agreed to participate. We were still optimistic. That's about 2,200 staff nurses. We'll be fine. So we send all our surveys out but only 393 nurses from 17 hospitals returned the surveys, despite doing all the right things and using Delman's method and keep going back, nope. And for two hospitals, the number of nurses responding was fewer than five. So what we wanted to do, we wanted to compare community hospital and nursing unit characteristics, the nurse work environment, and community perception of hospital quality um, and also nurse rated quality of care in these hospitals. So we had to be able to aggregate to the hospital level. And you can't do that with five nurses, less than five nurses. So we ended up, a sample was 385 staff nurses in six critical access hospitals and nine other rural hospitals. And we just did a regular descriptive comparison. Are there differences in these two types of rural hospitals? So, this is what we found. We found no differences in the majority of our factors influencing quality of care, which we didn't expect given our previous studies. But we did find that critical access hospitals were in communities with better economic status. That is um, very similar to what other researchers have done that have looked at all 1,400 critical access hospitals. They say they think the critical access hospitals have a Walmart effect. That means when a critical access hospital is in a community, it becomes an economic boost because it's the major employer. Just like when Walmart moves into an area, the area gets an economic boost. So that made sense. We also found that nurses had more experience in the critical access hospitals. But also, the nurses reported they felt that the community recognized their hospital as a good place for minor health issues, that connection with the community. They would go to their local hospital rather than go to another hospital. And they also said they would recommend their hospital to family and friends. So, yeah, we found, as I said, we made lemonade, but we did sit back and discuss okay, this primary data collection didn't go so well, and it's costly, it's complex, and we think that part of what was happening here that is what is very well known today, which is nurses have survey fatigue. We are surveying them up and down and around about everything almost every month. So why should they answer our survey? We weren't even part of the organization. So we looked at other methods to continue our research including large databases doing secondary data analysis. So the last two studies that I'm going to talk about are from the National Database, the National Database of Nursing Quality Indicators, or NDNQI. I always get it wrong. But in 2009, we've been watching it. In 2009, they finally had enough rural hospitals so we could use that data set. And in 2009, um, well, let me talk about the data set first. What they do, and really um, it was developed by the American Nurse Association and is, was later sold to Press Ganey. But what they do is, which was later sold to a Swedish company, so now everything we do is out of Sweden. Care interventions and, and quality of care in rural urban nursing units is what we used it for. What they do in this one um, is they do RN surveys yearly, so the RN are surveyed. And then they have quarterly data for all other indicators. And data is aggregated to the nursing unit level, which is what we found in our work too, is really where quality of care is made or lost. So this was really neat. Um, so in 2009, they had more than 1,900 hospitals that participated in NDNQI. Not quite half of the US hospitals, but a sizable proportion of hospitals. So we did a first a cross-sectional study where we um, extracted variables on 4,033 urban units from 538 hospitals in urban areas. 
and 205 rural units in 60 hospitals. This amounts to more than 100,000 nurse surveys. So even though, you know, when we talk ends, it sounds like, yeah, that's okay. It's actually a lot of people. And we looked at critical care, medical surgical, and rehabilitation units. And the quality indicators we looked, like, looked at was falls and pressure ulcers, because those are the same whether you're in an urban or a rural area. And what did we find? We found no difference according to rural location. But we did find differences according to geographic region, hospital size, unit type, nurse staffing, education, experience, and nurse outcomes. Besides geographic region, everything else was what had already been confirmed in the literature. And one of them is the more staff you had, the better you do. The more experienced nurses you have, the better you do, et cetera. The worse the nurses feel, the worse you do. So those we found. But in terms of geographic region, the fall rates were, were highest in the northeast and the pressure also were low, no, I'm sorry, lowest in the Northeast, and the pressure ulcers were lowest in the West. The South didn't do so well. We also found that rehab units had the highest rates of both fall rates and pressure ulcers. But this was cross-sectional data. So you're talking about associations, not um, any predictions or um, one affecting the other. So. We decided for the final study that I'm going to talk about, we did look at care interventions or what nurses do, and we did longitudinal analysis. Um, this had not been done before because the data is pretty crummy. Um, NDNQI, when we looked preliminary in 2009, had good data on this. We thought we could do this. If you think about how staff nurses do their documentation today, it's check marks. Very little is written, and it's never graded. So they either did it or they didn't. That's very hard to do research on, because most everything is going to be 100%. Yeah, I turned the patient, click. Yeah, but did you do it? How did you do it? How often did you do it? Et cetera, et cetera. So care interventions in NDNQI had more details. So and also, just because you are good one year, are you good the next year? So the last, what I'm gonna to talk to you about is what we're currently doing. We are looking at data from four, for four years, from 2010 to 2013. We have approximately 5,500 urban units, 326 rural units, um, and we are still looking at critical care, medical, surgical, and rehab units. By the way, the reason why we went ended up with those three categories is because those were the units that were in all hospitals. We could look both at rural and urban. Um, and we had up to 16 quarters of data, so we did longitudinal analysis to see if a unit had more staffing in one year, in one quarter, um, and they, it changed, did that also change their quality indicators? And it did. So this is hot off the press. I'm just going to, we, we, we are still interpreting. So I'm just going to show you a few uh, things. What we found was care interventions, and we had different kinds. If you look at assessment on admission, skin assessment on admission, which is one of the things we do to see if people have pressure ulcers. If you have a 10% increase in skin assessment on admission among patients, you have a 5% decrease in odds of a pressure also in urban units. So it actually does make a difference, financially too. If you have a 10% increase in any risk assessment, so risk for pressure also, which is more than the skin assessment. It's your nutritional status, it's how much you move, you know, depending on which scale you use. So any risk assessment was associated with 21% decrease in the odds of a pressure also in rural units. So we showed that what nurses do make a difference. All right, I'm getting down to the wire here. Um, so what do I conclude, or what do we, did we conclude from all of this? We have learned that rural is different, 
but we have yet not yet determined all the whys. We need to continue to peel the onion and examine all the layers. So I will continue this work. And as you noticed, none of these studies that I just um, presented had anything to do with interventions. So while we were doing these studies, a few options, opportunities came up to actually do intervention studies or intervention projects. And I will talk about those now, system interventions in rural areas. And I just picked three that I was part of. The first one is a nurse residency program. The second one is community health worker training. And the final one is a need assessment of um, a health department. So, the first one was a nurse residency program uh, supporting onboarding and retention of rural nurses, or SOAR-RN. It was a 12-month federally funded program that provided education and psychosocial support to newly licensed registered nurses in rural hospitals. Just like in other areas of the country, rural nurses, I mean newly licensed nurses, are especially vulnerable, which is why we develop nurse residency programs and, um, in many of our hospitals, and this was one of the first one in rural hospitals. During that 12 months, they met monthly for a day, a full day, and the, pra the practicum was, the curriculum was focused on rural practice. We had 23 hospitals participate, 16 of them were critical access hospitals, and they were in two states. And we had eight cohorts, or 176 nurses. What the nurses told us when we evaluate pre-post was they felt what increased for them was the peer support. They felt connected to others like themselves. They felt much better than when they started. And, the, and if you think about a rural hospitals, they might only have one or two uh, newly licensed nurses, so they really need to get their support outside of the hospital. And they also increased their confidence. They felt they could do the, what they had to do, especially in terms of communication skills, which we know is one of the things that newly licensed nurses struggle with, how to speak up, how to be part of the team. And they really felt that they learned skills in this curriculum to do that. They also felt that competency, that means um, they practice their skills in rural practice on how to run a code and coping with the stress of being a new nurse. Both of those improved as well. The next thing we did, or opportunity that came up, was poly palliative care training needs in a rural uh, uh, part of South Africa. We worked with a, a non-government organization in the Pumalanga province where we went in and identified palliative care training needs of the community health workers. We developed training sessions, and then we evaluated the usefulness of the sessions. We had 29 community health workers who participated in focus groups, and out of the data, we found they had eight palliative care learning needs, and we picked the three highest, which is the ones I have up here. They wanted to know more about HIV AIDS, about half, maybe a little more than half of their patients died of HIV AIDS, but they also more and more had the chronic care patients we have in this part of the world as well. Other chronic care, I should say. And then they wanted to know more about palliative care, both in the beginning and at the end of life. They also mentioned how hard it was for them. They wanted to know how to debrief, so we put that into the session as well. After we had trained them, we evaluated them, and they all found that it was useful and engaging. So this was really done in a shoestring budget, and we wanted to see if we were able to do this, and we were. So other research have found that community health workers are excellent healthcare providers if you train them. So that's really what we did here. The last system intervention is part of a bigger grant from the Gates Foundation, the NIH, and the, the National Science Foundation and it's out of the Global Healthcare Center at UVA. So, to expand more than 10 years of work from the Global Health Center, we were tasked um, to do a needs assessment. 
The work is concentrated in one South African community and two universities, UVA and University of Venda. And they wanted to develop more robust collaboration with the Department of Health. So we went in and did a needs assessment of all three components. So the Department of Health, the two universities, and the goal was to improve health in community, in the community and increase teaching and research at the two universities. We used a strength-based approach or appreciative inquiry. What you do when you use that method is you focus uh, on each area's strength and you use that, you've identified the strengths first, then you look at the needs and then you use the strength to um, solve the needs or come up with plans for the needs. It's a little different because we usually go straight for the problems. This was uh, turning it upside down. What we found, oh, and we looked at everything the Department of Health offered. They had hospitals, health centers, clinics, community health worker programs, and palliative care. So what, what one of our major findings was that the health department, what we can learn from them is how to run, best run primary care clinics to deliver high quality health care. Their primary care was out of this world even though they had very few resources and they were run by nurses and they had their quality indicators pasted on the walls so you could see patient satisfaction, you could see everything they did. It was very um, enlightening and nice to see. And we can teach them about acute care. We also found that the two universities' strengths, if we combine them, we could do training and educating um, for the health department's community health workers, and we did in diabetes and hypertension management. Okay, so we're almost at the end. So let me end this presentation by talking about where I think we go, which we will go next, where the next frontiers are. And I always love to include a picture of the frontier nurses in Kentucky. <laughs> okay, I had to say that. Janie Heath um, is sitting right down there. All right. Patient and families as equal partners of the team, teams, social determinants of health, big data, and funding are the five things that I will briefly talk about. Patient and families as equal partners. What this framework is showing, it was published in 2015, is how we can co-produce health. If we make patient and families equal partners in our quest for health, we can co-produce high-value healthcare services and subsequently good health for all. So you can see in this model how the patients and the professionals are at the same level and they intertwine. And that leads to the next frontier, which is teams. And here, from my own research, it's the study of teams. How do they work? How do that improve healthcare quality? And the other thing is doing team science. That goes for all scientists. You cannot do it in isolation, as I said. We also need to be much better at including social determinants of health, no matter what kind of research we do. There are many, and we need to look at variables at all the layers. And you cannot say, oh, I'm only going to look at two, because you're going to come up with results that are not going to be applicable to the people that you want to improve health for. So in order to really do this complex research, we have to use big data. And I like this quote. By 2020, experts predict that more than 20 billion everyday objects will be able to capture, receive, and share data via a vast interconnected global network linked together by inexpensive sensors, GPS, and the cloud. Just around the corner, real-time biometric data will be automatically captured and used to learn more about the impact of lifestyle on chronic diseases and wellness and ultimately change behavior to improve our health. This data can inform all our science. However, it's imperative that we include nursing's contribution. Right now, in the, this data that they are, have described there, there is nothing about what nurses do, or very little. It needs to be measured, but how else can we say why we are worth the money they put into us? And it has to be done in a meaningful way. And we as nurse scientists need to be at the table 
and develop this research. It doesn't matter what kind of research we do. Finally, the last frontier is funding. Yeah, and I put up a three. I think in all the years that I have been doing research, this has always been decrease in funding is always a key term, no matter where you go. So in order to be successful, you have to be creative. And a wise professor from, from South Africa once told me when I was complaining or concerned about the decrease in funding, especially for the kind of research I do. AHRQ, the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality, is on the chopping block almost every year. So every year I'm thinking, will I get one more year out of them? Should I submit my grant? Anyway, he said, Marianne, if you are interested in the donkey and they fund the tree, then you tie your donkey to the tree. <laughs> so thank you for allowing me to share my work and thoughts. And I will again say I did it with a lot of help. Thank you.